blessed uh, day or day and week in the Lord. Um, Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of our soul and of our spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Um, which means that we truly need the word of God today. Um, and that's what our first song is about is crying out to God and asking him to speak to us. Um, and let us, if you would, stand and sing 432 in our hymnals. Of course, it will be behind us. And speak, O Lord. beautiful Lord's Day, and uh, it is a joy and a blessing to see uh, some new faces as well that's with us at, at Pleasant Hill. Uh, let me just say first and foremost, uh, thank you all who participated yesterday in the evangelism outreach in uh, Portland at the Strawberry Festival. Uh, those who were able to come, and, and thank you to those who were unable to come, but you prayed for us. Uh, that was very important as well. Uh, we needed the help of the Holy Spirit, and I believe God, by His grace, and, and God the Holy Spirit uh, empowered us and ministered to us as we were able to minister uh, to others. There was, I don't know, they were expecting between twenty and 30,000 people, I think, yesterday. I don't know if it was that many that showed up. Uh, I know that uh, our church, Pleasant Hill, made up 300 gospel bags and we passed, it, passed all those out within probably four hours, maybe, four and a half hours. 
Um, we had a really nice location because people had to come kind of through us and get, you know, so people circled around. But we was able to uh, pass out over 500 gospel tracts, and I'm not quite sure how many um, bottles of water we gave away. But there was a lot of gospel conversations and people uh, that we were able to go out and engage uh, people with the gospel. People was handing out gospel bags, handing out tracts. And uh, one thing that I... Brother Rick and I spoke about this, and I think even Brother Ben, but um, everybody in Portland's saved. So when Jesus comes back, you'll be able to, to see them. Now, uh, you know, it's really sad that we live in a culture today where people will say that they're Christians and they're saved, and yet when you ask them what the gospel is, they can't explain the gospel. And the Bible says you can't be saved apart from understanding the gospel, that Jesus, that you are a sinner separated from a holy God, and that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take your place upon the cross. And he was buried, he rose again the third day, and he's ascended in the Father, at the Father's right hand. And by faith, I believe that Jesus has died for me, and he's changed my heart. We you know, got a whole host of different answers about coming to church, walking the aisle, uh, confessing your sins, Da, 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 but nothing about Christ. And so um, we want to pray for those tracts that was handed out yesterday. Uh, and so continue to pray that God would give fruit uh, as, um, as he would take those tracts and our efforts yesterday. Uh, one thing I, I really am thankful for at Pleasant Hill is that we are an evangelistic church. We are a mission-minded church. Um, you, you think, well, Brother Chad, that's just what we do. Well, you don't realize how odd this is. And so we want to continue to be evangelistic and mission-minded. And, and with that said, go ahead and be praying for the end of this month. Uh, Brother Jeremy and myself will be going to Syracuse, New York, along with First Baptist uh, Church of Briar, Texas. Pastor Randall's part of their church is going to be flying up there. Jeremy and I will be driving. And uh, just be praying that God would uh, help us as we share the gospel and reach out to help uh, the church plant there in Syracuse, um, New York, with Pastor John Speed. So go ahead and be praying for that. And a lot of other issues that we've got coming up, and I'm going to talk to you at the end of the service as far as announcements. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. This morning, ask him to bless our time together. Father, we are grateful um, to be able to come together this morning and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, that you have taken out our hearts of stone and given us a heart of flesh that we desire to worship you this morning. God, that you have saved us from ourselves and most of all from your wrath, and we are grateful for that. God, how you have uh, substituted us with your son Jesus, that he was a perfect, all-sufficient Savior. As he poured out his blood upon the cross, that uh, whoever would repent and believe upon Christ would be saved. And God, you have saved us, those who have repented and believed upon Christ. And now you have given us a desire to meet together uh, as your people, as a church called out assembly uh, to sing and to serve and to, to give and to hear the preaching of the gospel uh, for our sanctification and building up in our faith. Uh, I pray, Lord, that as we gather this morning that we would have our faith increased. Lord, that we would uh, hear the word of God spoken to us, not just audibly in our ears, but, Lord, in our hearts. We need a word from you this day, Father. God, thank you for the privilege of sharing the gospel yesterday. Lord, what an awesome privilege it was to stand on Main Street and, Lord, just distribute tracts out, just talking to people. And, and Lord, what a blessing as a pastor to see a congregation, uh, your senior adults out there passing out gospel tracts and, and, and children passing out gospel tracts and, and your young folks uh, just ministering and doing whatever they can do to, to be a part of this. And, and for those who prayed for our outreach, yesterday father we pray that it was a sweet smelling aroma to you and that you would bring a uh, great increase through the presentation of the gospel lord we pray as we meet this morning god that you most of all would meet with us reveal yourself to us through your word speak O oh lord as only you can for our good and for your glory we ask this in jesus name 
Amen. Let's stand to our feet and greet one another in the Lord. Let us sing, Blessed Be the Name, um, uh, hymn 310. Thank you. 
offertory hymn. Um, there is a fountain, um, which is hymn 224. Um, I really want to encourage you guys, you know, if we all got a hymn when we got new hymns, and there are Bible verses written in these hymns. And on this one, it says, Zechariah 13, 1. On the day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. We have a fountain in Jesus Christ. His blood has washed us clean and continues to redeem us every day of our lives. And uh, let us sing with open hearts and joy and worship about this fountain. Till I die, and. 
Father, we thank you, Lord, again for this opportunity, Lord. We can be together, Lord, in your house to sing your praises, Lord, and to hear your word. And Father, we just pray, and Father, that what was done yesterday is the packets that was given out and uh, the ones that was witnessed to, Lord, we just pray that the Holy Spirit would, would just uh, touch some hearts, Lord, and convict them, Father, that, that they need you as their Lord and their Savior. And Father, we thank you, Father, for our blessings, for we truly are a blessed people, Father. But we just thank you, Lord, we have the opportunity to give back to you a portion of what you have given us. And Father, we just pray that this offering will be used, Lord, to further your gospel for your honor and for your glory. For we'll ask it in Christ's name. Amen. A few weeks back, I was given the opportunity to go to T4G, and, and the songs there were just so amazing. They gave us this hymn, uh, hymnal, and I want to use it whenever available. And um, I want to sing of our great God, um, and we have a, a great God. God of highest heaven, 
glorify your name through me. Thank you, Brother Jeremy. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to John's third epistle, third John, um, we will study that today. I'm going to give you just a, a kind of a layout for the next several months, or next few months anyways at Pleasant Hill. I'm going to preach this sermon, the whole book, the entire book. Have you ever heard one book preached in one sermon? I'm going to preach the book of 3 John in one sermon. Um, and then the next two weeks, going to deal with some uh, a couple of issues that we need to address within the, the church. And then beginning in June, uh, the elders and I will be teaching through uh, the Baptist Faith and Message. It will be a series of messages entitled Doctrine Matters, What We Believe and Why We Believe It as Baptist. And we have a we have a secret guest preacher that's going to be with us in July, and uh, you'll hear more about that. He's going to come and preach one of our articles of faith, and so you will be receiving a, uh, a little booklet of the Southern Baptist, what we believe, our Baptist faith and message, or confession of faith, along also with the abstract of principles that our church holds to. It's amazing that a lot of Baptists don't understand that we are confessional people. We have a confession of faith that says this is what we believe and why we believe it. And so that will be distributed to you all as, as well in the next coming weeks. So that kind of gives you a, a roundup and a, kind of a, a view of what's going to be going on, and that will be in the month of June and July. So, however, today our task is 3 John. So let's begin reading in 3 John, verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing that you do all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephus, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, every one of them. And may the Lord add his blessings to his word. Let's pray this morning. Father, we do thank you for this concise letter that you have inspired through the Apostle John and Lord, it is inspired even today to us here at Pleasant Hill. Speak, O oh Lord, through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever wondered what the early church was like? You, you know, a lot of times we, we gather and we call ourselves the church. We are the called out ones. Uh, and, and we see all the sores and warts and the things that we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis and how we fail and how we are, uh, struggle with certain things in our life. But when we think about the early church, if you're like me, a lot of times I think about the early church as they had it all together. I don't know why because, well, maybe it's kind of like the Old Testament characters in the Bible. We think they are superhuman 
biblical characters because they're in the Bible. We think they're in the Bible, so they must have been really spiritual people. But it doesn't take you very long to read the Old Testament to find out that they're not really that spiritual, are they? Matter of fact, they are a lot like us, aren't they? They are fallen sinners who are in need of God's redeeming grace through the Son, Jesus Christ. And it doesn't take us long to read the New Testament, to begin reading through the Gospels of, of sin that people dealt with. But, but in particularly the church, when you get to the New Testament church, when you look at the day of Pentecost, uh, which, by the way, I think today is what they would be 50 50 days after uh, the Passover, Pentecost Day, 50 days afterwards. But when you get to, it has nothing to do with this, uh, when you get to Pentecost, you see Peter preaching the sermon where people are converted and the Lord begins to add to the church. And it doesn't take you long when you get to 1 Corinthians to begin reading about what Paul was writing to correct there in Corinth. We forget that the church in the New Testament, in our Bibles, didn't have it all together. And when we come to 3 John, we see even a, a, a really close look, it, we, a microscopic look into the life of the congregation. We know a lot of, about Paul's life. We know a lot about Timothy, uh, Timothy's life. We know a lot about uh, Peter and John, but what about the everyday Christian in the local church? Wouldn't you like to know about how they functioned in the church? Uh, how was, what did they do? Did they have it all together? Well, John lays out for us in Third John that no, they did not have it all together. I've once heard it said this way, ministry is messy. Have you ever heard that? Maybe not as a pastor, but as a Christian. Have you ever heard that ministry is messy? And then you ask the question, why is it messy? Because wherever there are people, there are problems. Have you ever figured that out? That's the reason why it just mind boggles me that somebody will just go from this church to this church to this church to that church thinking that they're going to find a perfect church. And guess what? There ain't one. There's no such thing as a perfect church because the only way you will ever find a perfect church, well, you're not going to find one on this side of eternity. And a lot of church members and a lot of pastors try to do ministry without dealing with people, and you can't have a ministry without people. And wherever people are, there's going to be problems. There's going to be a mess. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. So we need to ask ourselves when we come to the text this morning, are we part of the mess or are we a solution to the mess? Are we part of the problem that's in the church today or are we a solution to the problem that may be in the church today? Well, we get a close glimpse of what was taking place here today. And this epistle, this letter, even though it was written 1,900 years ago, is still relevant today. Why is that? Because a lot of times we think things are worse today than it was 19 years ago. I would, I would say no. Sin is sin. It's always been. The, what we have now that they didn't have 19 years ago is television, radio, internet, and click of a mouse. You can get find out what's going on across the world, newspapers and things of that nature, but sin is still sin, and we still need a Savior. And so as John writes this short letter, matter of fact, this is the shortest letter written in the, uh, the uh, John's writings, um, we, we find he writes again in truth and love and for the sake of the gospel. He begins this letter uh, writing it to a specific person, to a man by the name of Gaius. Gaius is a, is a member of this church that is, he's writing to and he's going to tell us that he really cares for Gaius. But in this short letter, John uses a word four times that stuck out to me as I begin to study this passage this week. And he uses the word word martyreia four times martyreia is the greek word that john uses which means witness or testimony and i thought about this as i begin reading this passage over and over john uses three men's names here gaius diotrephus and demetrius 
And each time he speaks of these three men's names, he uses the word witness or testimony or martyria. And it just made me think about us as a congregation, us individually as believers. What kind of witness do we have? What type of reputation do we uh, uh, show ourselves into the world today? Not only in the church, but also outside of the church. So I want us to notice these three men and their testimony. There's going to be three different testimonies, or actually two, but three des described differently in three different ways. The first thing, first testimony I want us to look at, the man's life, is Gaius and his testimony. Gaius was the encourager. If you notice in verses 1 through 8, Gaius was a, a dear friend of John. He begins the letter in his opening uh, uh, salutation here. Uh, you know, he says, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Gaius was a man of truth. He was dearly loved by John. John had a close affection with him. Some scholars said that, that Gaius perhaps was converted underneath John's ministry, perhaps at Ephesus or, or one of the other churches where uh, John had ministered to. And John wants to encourage Gaius. Why is that? Because as we get going down through this letter to Gaius, he is enduring some, some heavy opposition and even persecution for the truth. However, John is wanting him to be encouraged by saying in verse 2 that I am praying for you. Can you imagine receiving this letter by Demetrius, more likely who's the one who brought this to Gaius, and says, and you open it up and you read it, and it's the Apostle John saying, Brother, I am praying for you. I'm not only praying for you spiritually, but for your spirit, physical health as well, as he mentions in verse 2. 1 and, and 2, he says that, that it may be well with your health and with your soul. John loved and prayed for Gaius for a couple of reasons, and I believe five that we find in our text. The first one is in verse 3, because John says, For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified of your good reputation, or testified to your truth. Gaius was a man who knew the truth. What is the truth? We are reminded in 2 John and 1 John that Jesus Christ is God, can't come in the flesh. Not only was he God in the flesh who veiled himself uh, with flesh, but he was divinity. He was perfect. He never sinned one time. He never ceased being God at the cross. He never gave up his divinity, but, but he took the full wrath of his Father upon the cross and that Christ was buried, and he rose again the third day. Gaius understood the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gaius didn't try to deny the truth of who Jesus was, but rather he was faithful to that truth. And John prays for him and wants to encourage him because he is a man of good reputation when it comes to the truth. Just this Friday, I was driving to Alabama and I was going through the, uh, uh, the campus of the University of North Alabama and right there on the corner was uh, two Jehovah's Witnesses with a, uh, with a book rack of about six foot tall. And they had all their literatures and their Bibles in there. And another brother had texted me Thursday, said that he had some Jehovah's Witnesses come to his house. And he was thanking me for, uh, uh, for the sermon a couple weeks ago that I preached out of Second John. It was timely on how to handle uh, heretics and false teachers. And I drove past them and I thought, I just, I'm going to have to just turn around. And I made the city block and I pulled in and there was... Uh, two Jehovah's Witnesses there, and I got out, and they kept talking to me about the truth. If I wanted to know the truth, I never did tell them I was a pastor. I just told them that I was interested in their view of, of their understanding of who God was, and I asked them after they shared with me, because the first question I asked them was, how can I know God? And you know what they told me? They told me an answer that most Baptists would tell you. Study your Bible live the Bible, and accept Jesus. I said, so if I do those three things, I can have assurance that I'll know Jehovah. 
Well, no, you can't know for sure. And that's where I began to share the gospel. I said, I know that I have eternal life because Christ is not a mere created being. He is God who has come and took on flesh and lived a perfect life that I could not live and died a death that I could not die in order to pay a debt that I will never be able to pay regardless of how many times I read the Bible or how many, how close I keep to this. Matter of fact, I said, I can't do it. I said, ma'am, you need to repent and believe in what Christ has done for you. They said, well, you need to have a Bible study with some of our elders. I said, I've done been down that road before and it just hasn't worked out that well. The truth of the gospel. Gaius knew the truth of the gospel. But notice also in the last part of verse 3, Gaius walked in the truth of Christ. Here he says, as John says, as indeed you are walking in the truth. Not only did Gaius believe the gospel, he lived the gospel out. That word walking, peripateo, it means the way of life. The old King James uses that word conversation of life. I've always wondered when I was growing, what does that mean, conversation? It means the way you live your life, the way that you walk your life out. Gaius believed the truth, but he also lived it out. Isn't that something that's hard for us to do sometimes as Christians, somebody's asked me before, what's the hardest thing of being a pastor? Living what you preach. Living out what you believe. We believe these truths, we believe these gospels, and yet we fail. Gaius was a faithful man. His testimony was faithful as he lived these truths out in his life. But also, Gaius gave John great joy in hearing his faithfulness, verse 4. John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. What joy does it bring to the parent's heart to see their child raise up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and you instruct them of the Lord, you teach them the Bible, you, you carry them to the church, you pour your life in them and you mess up and you, and you sin before them and yet God in his mercy and his grace, he, he, he sovereignly and supernaturally changes their hearts and saves them and now they're walking in the way of the Lord. Does it not bring your heart great joy as a parent? But on the flip side of that, it brings breaks our hearts when our children are not walking with the Lord. This is what gave John great joy was hearing of Gaius' walking with the Lord, his faithfulness. In verses 5 and 6, we, we find out that Gaius was very hospitable. Now, John chapter 2, John has already written talking about how we are not to be hospitable, not to bless and to give and to support false teachers. Now, here is the flip side of this. John is commending Gaius for supporting the preachers of the truth. Notice with me in verse 5 and, and through 8. He says, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers. What brothers? They're strangers, as they are, who testify to the love, to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. What has happened is these itinerant preachers, I'll call them evangelists for the sake of our uh, modern time understanding, they, there were false evangelists, heretics traveling around from church to church, which was in homes, home to home, and wanting to he have a hearing and to get support from the local congregation. That's Second John. Here we have Third John, and we have a man by the name of Gaius who has been faithful to receive these preachers, these itinerant ministers, into their home and to minister to them. And John says, you will do well to send them on to the next place, to the next church, in a worthy manner of God. In other words, not to re restrain their giving, but to, to support and to encourage. And that's what we find in verses 7, or seven and 8. John says, the apostle says, for this reason they have gone out for the sake of the name, the name of Christ. These preachers, they're going around preaching the gospel that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, come, died, was buried, and rose again the third day. They, these preachers are living only because of the faithful giving and hospitality of the saints. And he says, make sure that you support them. Why? Because they're not going to take anything from the Gentiles. Who's the Gentiles? They're the unbelievers. What John is saying is that it is not right. 
it is not right for these preachers to be traveling around preaching the truth, the name of Christ, and then have to rely on the unbelievers to support their ministry. And he says in verse 8, Therefore we ought to support like these that, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. So in your support of the preaching of the word and the advancement of the gospel, you are fellow workers for the truth. Uh, let me help illustrate a little bit. I've been here going on seven years now, and about every year, as far as I can remember, we have had some kind of Bible conference, a special meeting with a special preacher, uh, <clears throat> and we would bring them in. As far as I know, in seven years that I've been here, I have yet heard somebody say, well, what are we going to pay them? I have yet heard anybody say that. I've been in meetings before where people will say, well, what are we going to pay them? There's a difference between a job and a calling. God has called these men, like Brother David Miller, like Brother Don Curran, like Brother Randall Easter, like all the other pastors that's come in year after year. What have they done? They didn't come here for a paycheck. They came to invest into your soul and to my soul the living word of God that we just sang about, speak, O Lord. And so as they invest in our souls, the Bible tells us that they are worthy of their hire. It's kind of like the ox. Paul tells Timothy, do not muzzle the ox. Matter of fact, you ought to give them double honor. In other words, you ought to give that ox, if he labors and crushing that corn, you ought to feed him good, water him good, take good care of him. Why? Because he is doing the work for you. He is, he is serving you in a sense. And that's the same way with these itinerant preachers that would come around. And and, and let me just go ahead and say this, too. We've also had women come in, not women preachers, but women speakers as conference speakers speaking and ministering to the women of the church, and, and they took time out to come. And we, as a congregation, have had the privilege and the joy to minister and to bless ease these speakers. I will tell you, as your pastor, there has not been one time since I've been here in seven years that I have ever been embarrassed at what we gave a guest speaker or preacher. I have never been embarrassed at all. Matter of fact, I've had preachers call me back and say, wow, there are churches three times your size that didn't even touch what you all did. I'm trying to brag on y'all a little bit, okay? Smile. No, that is God working in and through you as you preach. And, and it's not, we have didn't pass the plate around. I've been here seven years and during a revival meeting, we have not passed the plate around, I don't think. I think we've done free will offerings. If you want to give, there's offering plates up here. You can give offerings. And, and you went above and beyond. This is what John is telling Gaius. He is saying, Gaius, you have been an encourager for these preachers who are preaching the truth. They have come and they have uh, ministered and, and uh, ministered the word of truth and you have encouraged them. Praise the Lord. He says, therefore, you are partakers of that. Right now in the Philippines, you are partakers of what God is doing in the Philippines. Right now, all over the world, missionaries that we support and give to and people that we have brought in here and support and pray for, we are partakers of the truth going out. Just like yesterday. You see, nothing is separated from the local church. That's the reason why I can't understand how people say, well, I can be saved and I don't need the church. Well, Jesus died for the church. That's kind of redundant. It doesn't make sense. We see that Gaius was the encourager. Now we get to Diotrephus, another testimony. In verses 9 through 10, we see this testimony of a man by the name of Diotrephus. More than likely, he is the, one of the elders of the church. And notice what John says in verse 9, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephus, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, and not contend 
not with, content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to, wants to and puts them out of the church. I have yet find a church where there has not been someone, some way that Satan begins to work through trying to stop the work of God. When God is at work, you can always assure yourself that Satan is working as well. Now, Satan is bound and, and, sub, and subjected to God in his sovereign will and sovereign power. Satan can't do anything. Uh, matter of fact, you read Job. Satan had to come ask God for permission to even attack Job. But we find that Diotrephus is a dictator here. And as Gaius is wanting to serve and be a minister and, and, and take these preachers into the home and bless them and write them a check and, and feed them and, and just love on them but for the sake of the gospel, there's that one person, Diotrephus. And notice what the Bible says. The King James says, it hey, uses the word preeminence, which simply means, as the ESV puts it, who likes to put himself first. Diotrephus was more concerned about himself than he was the gospel of Jesus Christ. Diotrephus was one who was more concerned about the budgets and the self-image of the church rather than getting the gospel to the ends of the earth. Diotrephus was more concerned for his comfort and what would make him look well than he was for the sake of those who would repent and believe the gospel. We can see this in the statements that John makes in verse 9. We see that Diotrephus was a, a self-promoter. He was all about himself as he placed himself above the gospel, even to the point that he was insubordinate. At the end of verse 9, he would not submit to authority, even to apostolic authority. John says here that Diotrephus does not even acknowledge our authority. There, there's always those who's going to buck. There's always going to be those who's going to fight or kick against the goads. We go on down. We see that Diotrephus was slanderous. He says there in verse 10 where he spoke nonsense and slandered the, the apostles. Just go ahead and get ready for it as a Christian or in leadership. You're always going to have those who come against you and who will slander you and who will hear things. I think we talked about this Wednesday night how you can have 60 people in the congregation and 60 people will hear 60 different things and they will misinterpret that and they will run with that and there will be more division and faction and this is what Diotrephus was. He spoke nonsense, John says, but in the last of verse 10, John says, so if I come, I will bring up what he is doing talking wicked nonsense against us and not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who wants to and puts them out of the church. Geotrophus said this, and this is what he done. If you welcome one of those preachers and, you, and, and show him hospitality, he says this is what's going to happen. You're no longer going to be a member of this church. You're no longer going to be a part of this congregation. And then you begin to w wonder, is Diotrephus even saved? Is he even converted? Here's a man who is self-promotion, promotes himself. He's unwilling to submit to authority that God has divinely placed in his life with the apostles. So he's insubordinate, don't want authority over him. He's slanderous. He's a gossiper. He's spreading false rumors. And then he's vindictive. He would not receive certain brothers and then even cast them out of the church. And then the very next verse, John tells us, Beloved, do not imitate evil. John is saying, you want to see someone who's, who more than likely is not converted? You want to see somebody in the church who is more than likely rebellious and lost and on their way to hell? Look at, look at Diotrephus. Look at his testimony. Look at his witness. So what is the outcome for a church when you have somebody like Diotrephus? Have you ever seen a Diotrephus in the congregation? Yes, no. Have you ever saw anybody who is self-promoting, vindictive, unwilling to submit to authority? slanderous 
The Lord really impressed upon me this week as I was meditating on this text, and I even ran it through another pastor last night, and he said, I don't know if I'd share that, and so I, I take counsel real well, and I'm going to go ahead and share it. But as I begin to study this text, I begin to think, am I Diotrephus? Am I Diotrephus? The scholars say that Diotrephus was more likely an elder in the congregation here. And, and, I, and I begin to pray and I begin to seek the Lord and, and I found out I am a Diotrephus. I am a Diotrephus. I'm self-promoting. I don't like authority. I slander. I'm vindictive. But you see, I'm not the only one. You are too. You are too. If you're saying, no, you're not, that just proves you are. Do I have to get my way all the time? I said, no, I'm not like that, Brother Garrett. I don't have to. But deep down, yeah, I do. I want my way. But then I begin to realize that's what Christ went to the cross for. And as I repent of my sin, as I look to Calvary that the blood was poured out on my behalf, I'm reminded that if I confess my sins, I, I, I'm cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And even though that there are times in my life that I, I, my testimony, my witness, I, I, I'm self-promoting and, and insubordinate and slanderous and vindictive, I'm reminded that's the reason why Christ died on the cross was to, to forgive me of my sins. And I'm able to go to my Father and say, Father, forgive me in the name of Jesus Christ. Help me with this sin. Help me. I don't want to go there no more. I don't want to go back there again. But guess what? I end up going back there again. And God in His mercy and His grace by the conviction of the Holy Spirit drags me back and says don't go there repent believe remember I killed my son for you repent and he poured his blood out for you we see Diotrephus a dictator and let me just say this I know of churches and one church in particularly that's had a spirit of Diotrephus in it for 40 years and it has killed the church it's had a spirit of Diotrephus in it what do you mean, Brother Chad? It means that there's been a certain family or certain individuals in that congregation and they are self-promoting. It's either my way or the highway. If you're going to come to this church, you better look like us, dress like us, sing like us, use the Bible that we use. We're not going to do anything the way that you say. And they've said this to pastors before. They use the seven famous words, we ain't never done it that way here before. And when you hear those seven words, they are seven words that the church is dead or dying. And they have had spirit, they have had blessed times of the Lord where, where pastors would come in and they would change something small and then that, that Diotrephus spirit would raise up and say, now look, we know that people are, are getting saved and people's coming to know the Lord, but let me tell you, you don't need to cross this line because we're in control of this place, not you. And that's the reason why the church is, for, for, his, for history purposes, well, has had a multiplicity of pastors. This church is probably about 100 years old or a little bit more. They've had over 40 to 50 pastors because of the Diotrephus spirit. And it breaks my heart for some pastors that I speak to. Do you understand that this is a rarity right here? that your pastor's been here seven years. It's really rare. I'm, I'm trying for 10 years. If y'all just let me stay here 10 years. It's a rarity for a pastor to stay at church. The, the average stay for a pastor is two to three years. Why is that? Because it's just like marriage. When you first get married, you're goo-goo eyes, you're in love, and oh, da, 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 honeymoon, and then about two years happens. I usually say about six months. I don't do my last marriage counseling session until six months after the wedding because at six months after the wedding, guess what's happened? They had a disagreement, they've had their fight, and they've had time to make up. 
If they haven't, I said, make sure you're getting one when we leave here. No. But that's the same way in churches. We Pastors come in, they stay, and everything is good for the first six months to two years. And then all of a sudden, the pastor changes something, and all of a sudden, the spirit of Diotrephus raises up, and we don't like that. We've never done it that way, and it's time to go. And there's pressure on the pastor, on the family, on the church. And next thing you know, he's in depression, He's what? and he's sending resumes out, and they're gone within two years. But when we see that God is greater than Diotrephus, see, that's our problem. We begin to take our eyes off of God and put them on Diotrephus and that spirit and everybody tucks tail and run. But when we see that our God is working in the midst of this. So, what about you? What kind of spirit do you have in you? What kind of testimony? What kind of witness? Do you have a testimony of Diotrephus, a spirit of Diotrephus? I've often wondered, and even this week as I was thinking, how do you, there's such a fine balance. Me and other brothers talking about this morning. As a pastor, how do you lead the congregation without being a quote, unquote, Diotrephus, the dictator? Does anybody know? I'm asking you because I don't. I'm new at this. You lead the congregation, right? But you don't lead so far out in front of them and, and you're leading, and they're leading with you. And so we have been graced here for the last seven years that there has been a few changes along the way. And we've felt some, and I have felt it. If you haven't, I have. I felt it for you. Some, some kickback and some rebuttal and some, and then we step. But the church, that is what a healthy church is. It's always reforming and always reforming, changing and always changing, moving forward, but not so far ahead that the people are dragging behind and saying, whoa, whoa, you come back. And that's the delicate thing of being a pastor and, be, and loving the sheep. And that's not what Diotrephus was. The third thing in verses 11 through 14, the third witness, the third testimony we see is by the man of the name of Demetrius. Notice in verse 12, Demetrius has received a good testimony again from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. Here's a man by the name of Demetrius who is a faithful brother. More than likely, Demetrius delivered this letter to Gaius, the scholars say. And as he brings this letter, in this letter, John is affirming Demetrius to Gaius saying take this brother trust him he is a good brother because he has received a good testimony from everyone well there's a problem there John because the Bible says in Luke 6 what if everybody speaks well of you woe is that man but John is talking about everyone in the church Demetrius testimony was faithful from the brothers in the church nobody had a bad word to say about Demetrius he was faithful he was consistent but not only that, but he lived the word. He says the testimony of the word itself. The word of God testified and, and it proved to Demetrius' life that he was a consistent and faithful brother. And then John says in verse 12, the last part, and even our testimony, the apostles, the apostles said that John or uh, Demetrius was a faithful brother. John encourages Gaius to imitate what is good. John sends this letter to Gaius, and he says, here is your examples, Diotrephus or Demetrius. Who should you follow? Who should you imitate? If you're going to choose between a Diotrephus or a Demetrius, choose Demetrius because he has proven himself to be faithful. Uh, Simon Kistemacher says in his commentary, Demetri Demetrius lived according to the mandates of God's word so that his life showed clear evidence of the truth. Demetrius was faithful. He was consistent. He exemplified consistency. Demetrius was a life that others could imitate. Now, are we to imitate other people's lives? Is there anybody in your life that you remember a godly man or a godly woman who lived in the fear of God? H have you, do you know anybody that you can remember or even perhaps even in our congregation who I'm not saying was perfect, but they was consistent. They was just consistent. 
They didn't swerve to the right. They didn't swerve to the left. Come hell or high water, they're going to follow their Lord. They're going to follow their Savior. Even though life falls apart around them, they don't understand. Even though they grow old and weary and feeble, you can just see as they imitate trusting and holding on to God. That's all they know to do. They're just holding on to their faith in their God. They're just looking to God. They don't care about what Brother Chad says. They don't care about what uh, the, the deacons or the elders say. They're holding on to their God when everything crumbles apart. And they're going to keep serving their God even if Brother Chad leaves. Even if whatever happens, they're going to be faithful. And this was Demetrius. We find this context of 1 Corinthians 4 verses 14 through 16 where Paul is writing to the the Corinthians there and he says imitate me as I imitate Christ 1 Corinthians 11 1 Paul says again to the Corinthians be imitators of me as I imitate Christ I would hope that in our congregation that there are people here that my children can look to and that I can look to and see Christ working in your life. Brother Rick asks us every Sunday morning in Sunday school, what is God doing in your life? What is God doing in your life? How is Christ working in you and through you? And he's not just talking about, well, we went out past out 500 bags. It might have been, well, I washed dishes for my wife because I loved her and I want to lay my, my life down for her. Amen, women? Mm. It's just being faithful in the mundane things. It's not necessarily the the street preaching and the evangelism. It's loving your wife as Christ loved the church, raising your children up and nurturing and admonition of the Lord. It's just being faithful in the things that God has prescriptively told us in His Word. So oftentimes people are looking for God's will and and His secret will or His hidden will His decreed will that we'll never know when God has revealed uh, to us His will in the Scriptures. And Demetrius was just faithful. He was consistent. Many of you who are sitting in the pews even today has been faithful and consistent. Not perfect, but consistent. My faith has been encouraged. My faith has grown because of your walk with the Lord as you imitate Christ. I pray as I get older in my age that you all and my children, my grandchildren and other Christians here will be able to look at my life and say, he's been consistent. He's been faithful. Not perfect. Messes up. He's a sinner. Needs to repent. Needs the blood of Jesus applied every day. But been faithful. Demetrius was faithful. I want to ask you this. Can this be said about you here this morning? Are you consistent in your walk with Christ. Let me tell you, we'll never be consistent in our walk with Christ if we don't know Christ. We'll never be able to be faithful in and of ourselves. It's because it's Christ that lives in us that allows us to be consistent and faithful. It's the Spirit of God within the believer who convicts us when we sin. And we say, we know we ought not have done that. Father, forgive me. Uh, Can your children, can the children of this congregation look at your life and say, I am consistent. I am walking with the Lord. I want them to imitate me. You should have been in Sunday school. Brother Rick was preaching about me and preaching to me. And, you know, uh, he just hit the nail on the head. I want to be faithful. I want to be found faithful at the end of it. Let me close with these remarks. I want to give three practical applications when we think of Demetrius, Diotrephus, and Gaius. These are three men who gives us three examples, three testimonies, three witnesses. First of all, I want to ask you, which spirit do you have? Which spirit do you have? What testimony do you bring with you? And when I say that, I want to add on these three things about the lesson. Christians are not always what we should be. Would you agree? Christians are not always what we should be. 
We may have to serve in the face of opposition from other brethren. We have the stress of everyday life. And, but God in His grace has changed our nature to where we no longer want to be what we used to be. You've heard that said before. And God gives us a heart and a desire to repent. And we have a new nature with sin and with our relationship with God. We're not, we're not always what we should be. But thank God we're not what we used to be. Number two, Christians often imitate other Christians. Christians often imitate other Christians. I uh, just thought about this a little while ago. I was riding my bicycle the other day on Providence Road, and there's a farmer there with a bunch of sheep. And I slowed down, and I changed gears, and my gear popped real loud, and there was about 20 sheep, and all of a sudden, one took off, and they all looked around, and they all followed that sheep. I wasn't going to hurt them. But Christians often imitate other Christians. What does this mean? It means when there's a spirit of diatrophus in the congregation, a spirit of division, a spirit of faction, a, division, a, a, a murmuring, complaining, griping, insubordination, it doesn't take long for that to, to go to another believer and to another believer and to another believer. And as Barney Fife says, if it's not nipped in the bud, you know what happens? It spreads like cancer in the congregation and the congregation's heart becomes hardened. It becomes hardened to the sense where the gospel doesn't resonate in our hearts anymore. I'm not repenting of my sins anymore. I'm not as loving as I used to be. And the church becomes callous and the Spirit of God, it just seems like there's a, a, just a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Just a, a quenching of the Spirit in the church. It doesn't take long. And if you've ever been in a church like that before, believe me, you, it's not a pleasant tree. Number three, Christians should battle the spirit of Diotrephus every day, every day. You see, when you were saved, if you're a Christian here today, when you were converted, the Spirit of God come inside to live with you, within you. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit does a lot of things, convicts us of our sin. And the Holy Spirit enables us to battle against sin and the power thereof. And as a Christian today, you and I must battle the spirit of Diotrephus, not allowing him to reign. Because there, as the old Puritans would say, it's like you're alive in Christ, but you're still dragging around this dead corpse, this flesh. It's like you have a dead man on your back walking every day as a Christian. The new man is alive inside of you, but you are dragging around the old you. That's the old you, and the flesh tells you you're too tired to read your Bible. You're too tired to pray. You've you're, you got all these other reasons and excuses why you can't do this and do that. That's the old man, the old flesh. However, the new you, the Spirit of God that's within you, battles the spirit of Diotrephus. What does this spirit of Diotrephus needs to be battled? Think about your desire to dominate, to dominate, to rule. It needs to be battled against. Or what about... What about if you're a member here or been a member of a church where there's been a diatrophous spirit, a strong spirit of, 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 of domination and dictatorship, and yet you wouldn't say anything? Or another brother or sister who is in sin and, and not confront it? Or not supporting those who stand for the truth? I thought about this in our text and I thought about Diotrephus, and the scholar says he was an elder. I've yet to understand, Brother Jeff, why they didn't fire him or practice church discipline on him. And then, it, as I read some more, they said more than likely that this Demetrius, as he comes, they wasn't even of the same congregation, although they knew one another. 
Diotrephus was able to get away with the domination strongly because of the congregants. And that leads me to close with this. Even if a pastor, even if a pastor gets out of line, and, and that's one reason why your pastor led us to have a plurality of elders, but even the elders, if there's a strong sense of dictatorship, of self-promotion, insubordination, vindictiveness, it has to be addressed in a gracious and loving way. And at the same manner, I would say, even for the elders, it's even that much more so for the congregants and for the members of the congregation. When the, when the spirit of Diotrephus rises up in the congregation, it has to be dealt with. Because if not, it will spread within the congregation. Now, some of you here today are perhaps... Christians, but not church members. Some of you may not even be Christians here today. And what I have just exposed you to was just the reality of the church. The church is not perfect. And if you ever find a perfect church, let me know because I'm going to go with you. But when we get there, we're going to mess it up. Even if I don't go, you're going to mess it up. But we see the reality of of the witness that we are presenting to each other and to the world. So I, I submit to the Christians here today, what spirit do you have? Are you like Gaius, an encourager? Do you encourage others in their work and, and, and their, uh, the faithfulness of the preaching ministry? And let me say, you at Pleasant Hill have been a blessing personally to me. I'm a missionary in a sense. We're all missionaries. But you have supported my family and I very well. Thank you. And all the pastors and evangelists that has come here and preach, uh, the baskets that was put in, in the hotel room, dinners that was bought at, at different locations and paid for by the congregation, that was honoring and pleasing to the Lord. The love offerings that was given, the pats on the back telling you thank, t- tell them thank you for the word. The Lord is honored in that. And then you have Demetrius who was faithful. He was faithful brother. He was consistent in the church. Do you have those testimonies? Is that what people say about you? Or is it Diotrephus? You have the testimony of Diotrephus. Well, here's the good news. If you're a Christian, repent. Ask him to forgive you. And as I said earlier, we are all Diotrephus somewhere throughout the day, aren't we? But if you're here today without Christ... You'll never be an encourager. You'll never be faithful. And you'll always be a diatrophist. But you see, that's what Christ went to the cross for. He went to the cross for people like diatrophists. He went to the cross for people like you and like me who were sinners who have rebelled against God. And He poured His blood out that if you would believe upon Him that you would be saved. As the sign says at the road frontage, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you a whosoever today? If you are, call upon the name of the Lord. Believe, trust, repent, and be saved. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Help us all as Christians here today to live a faithful life in light of the Scripture. Help us to be reminded that we are all diatrophists needed, needing grace and the forgiveness of God in Christ Jesus. Help us to be reminded that we need to repent. And God, give us a spirit of Gaius to be an encourager to those who minister the word and, and to encourage one another as brothers and sisters in Christ as we go out here today into the world to, to be a blessing to those that we run into this week. To share the gospel to tell others of of the love of Christ. Father, help us to be faithful. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, moreover, it is required of a steward to be found faithful. Father, help the fathers of this church to be faithful. Help the mothers to be faithful to you. Give them grace. Grandmothers and grandfathers, nieces and nephews and aunts and uncles who are Christians here today, give us the grace to be faithful 
And so the world will see Christ living in us. And therefore, we would be able to give them the hope that lies in us as believers. Holy Spirit, just work as only you can in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing this morning. Let us sing How Great Thou Art. real quickly I want to make <clears throat> make known um, <clears throat> where do I begin first of all the uh, Fidelis class Miss uh, <clears throat> Sandra Stump's Sunday school class is collecting money for the Baptist Children's Home uh, as a missions project so if you're interested in donating that uh, please uh, see Miss uh, Linda Cook right is that correct and uh, <clears throat> so uh, deadline is May the 29th, uh, so keep that in mind and hope we'll get that in the bulletin next week. Uh, also, uh, don't know which one to, to announce first, I guess I'll go ahead and do this. The community church picnic is June the 5th, beginning at 4 o'clock. It's going to go to about dark, 8 o'clock, and uh, so keep, there's flyers out in the back, and uh, we want to distribute the. This is going to be, uh, this is not just church-wide. We, we want to invite the community to come be a part of that. Uh, something we did not do that we're going to do this year, we're going to, we're going to sing a few songs and also maybe have a 10 to 15-minute uh, devotion and gospel presentation. So invite your friends to come and be your guest and uh, uh, pick, pick these up and, and get those distributed. Also, uh, before you leave, as you go out, pick up a flyer, pick up a book, this is going to be our new Sunday school material that we're going through for the month of June and July. Uh, the one-room Sunday school uh, time that we'll have uh, is called I Will. I want everybody to get a book, and uh, this is your book. Church bought it, and this is what we're going to go through 
for June and July, one week at a time, so read chapter by chapter. It's not a big book. This is the second book that we studied last year, what it means to be a church member, and now since we know what it means to be a church member, what do we do? And so this is going to help us be reminded of our responsibility and our privilege and joy of being a church member. And so pick one of these up as you head out uh, today. Um, as far as I know, I, I, I don't guess anyone else is interested in going to Syracuse, New York. But if you are, I need to know no later today. And so I'm going to let you have time to go home and get in your prayer closet and fast over at today. And you can call me tonight and let me know how the Lord impresses upon you to go with me and Jeremy uh, to uh, New York. Uh, and then, again, the new... Uh, new preaching sermon series we'll have in June coming up. Just a lot going on and thankful that, that the Lord's working in our midst. Um, any other announcement before we dismiss? I have to get these out. I read an article the other day that says announcements are just really weird in church services. You don't know where to put them. At the beginning of the service, at the end of the service, on the screen, don't say anything about them. So we just uh, defaulted to the end. Let's stand and pray together and be dismissed. Brother Garrett, would you dismiss us, brother, in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're always thankful to be gathered together in this church here at Pleasant Hill. We're thankful for the word we receive this day. And Father, we pray that by the Holy Spirit, you apply these truths to our hearts. That Father, we would consider how we might be a goddess or Demetrius. And Father, that we would live out a godly life in Christ Jesus, encouraging one another, knowing that. Father, the, the day draws closer today than when we first believed. And Father, that we might also be found faithful on that day on your son's return. Father, you should take us home before that. Mm -hmm. Father, we have uh, a purpose in being here. You've called us in Christ Jesus, called us to, to work so to glorify you, to be on mission. And Father, we pray that this week as we go out to our homes and throughout this community and our workplaces, that you would empower us to share the gospel with someone. And perhaps to change a soul for all eternity. Uh, be glorified. We pray this in Christ.